This morning's worship was so great, so if you have to leave and you have to go get meds or do whatever you need to do, um, don't feel bad. But I don't know that I can shorten this, and this is what God's given me for you. The title is The Battle's Not Mine. The Battle is Not Mine. You know, I was reading on Facebook this week. I was reading about schools in Maine and one particular school that I'm not going to name, but how it's been overlooking bullying that's been going on in the public school system. And this one student, this one male student got on there and he shared his story very in depth, how he was being picked on, how he was being ostracized by students. He had moved from one place and moved into this new town and once again it starts all over again. He said, there's nothing I've done wrong. There's nothing that I did to cause this to come upon myself, but it seems like no matter what, I get picked on. He says, and people, you know, people will punch, people will say things, people will do mean things, and he says it's just never ending. He goes to the staff and the staff ignores it. The staff overlooks it. The staff says, well, you gotta have proof. There's no proof. And they won't do anything about us, about it. Even those that have the ability to do something about it, they just overlook it. Many of us perhaps have gone through some of the same types of battles in our lives, whether it was in our childhood or in a workplace, it just seems like we're always under attack or you've been under attack and you've done nothing to deserve it. You've done nothing to bring it on and, and it seems like everyone around is just overlooking it. Nobody seems to care. How many can relate this morning to, to these words? You know, it's a shame that nowadays we send our kids, those that send their kids to the public school it's like sending them off to a battlefield. You know, you read every year, several times a year, of students taking and hurting other students. And um, it's not right. It's not right. I remember when my kids were in school and they were in the public school, my older ones, and they would say someone said something to them or someone did something, and I'd say, look beyond it. Remember that hurting people hurt others. I said, you don't know what kind of life they have at home. You may see one thing, but you don't know what it's like at their house. Maybe those things that they're doing to you, they're receiving from someone else. You don't know. I said, so try to be kind to them. Try to be nice to them. But yet, stick up for the one that they're picking on. Stand up for that one. Don't forget about them. Don't let them be hurt. Don't let them be picked on. Stand up for them. The reality is that most everyone's felt some type of rejection in our life. The battle's different all throughout life. You know, what the battles from when we're teenagers or young students to when we're young adults to when we're older. Each and every one of us have different battles. And each and every one of us have different battles. What is it that's your battle? Is your battle with your peers, others, bullies? Is your battle with relationships? Always getting into the wrong type of relationships? Do you battle with finances, weight, addictions? Do you battle with bitterness, anger, hate, rejection? Do you battle yourself? Is it your flesh? Is it your self-esteem, your self-image, your self-worth? Do you battle temptation to do wrong, to sin, to self-gratify, to self-indulge? Do you battle pride and arrogance, emotions, thoughts? Do you battle with sickness, pain, and disease? What is your battle? Now that battle always seems worse than what it really is. And God can see us through each and every battle, no matter how big it is in our eyes. It's not that big in God's eyes. 
and know that we're not on our own. When we go to battle, we're not on our own battling, but God is with us. I want you to turn this morning to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'm going to be kind of going verse by verse and talking a little bit um, and adding in a few other verses here and there. But 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 3 through 7. So we're going to see the Israelites and the Philistines are on different mountaintops ready for a battle. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 3. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. We see here that to all the Israelites, the battle looked big. The battle looked intimidating. You know, you have this giant that's coming out there, and it goes in depth describing what he was wearing and everything. It was the Philistines, or really, it was Goliath against all the Israelites. Not even all the Philistines came down, but it, it, they were there, but it was the giant Goliath that came forward. And the, and the Israelites, seeing the giant, thought it was overwhelming. They thought it was impossible. The enemy seemed stronger. The enemy seemed bigger. But let's look what God says. You want to keep um, 1 Samuel and Mark because we're going to keep flipping back to it. But let's look what God says about the enemy seeming stronger and bigger. Let's see what he says in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. Joshua 1 verse 5 and 6. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of, the, as, of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. God is with us. You know, that was, that was for Joshua, but that's for us today, too. God is with us. He's not going to fail us. He's not going to forsake us. It doesn't matter how bad the battle looks. It doesn't matter how big the problem looks. God is with us. He is there. He is our strength. He, is, he says, be strong. Be strong and be of good courage. That he is with us in the midst of the battle. The enemy likes to use intimidation. Let's look at 1 Samuel 17, verses 8 through 10. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let it come down to me, if he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And you can see him again to use intimidation in verses 43 through 44. 43 through 44, he once again tries to intimidate them. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. 
So the enemy likes to use intimidation. So whatever battle it is that you're in, he tries to intimidate you. You know, I think of right now with Teresa and getting her job and her education, and, and she hasn't gotten a job. You know, the enemy can use that to intimidate her. Oh, that bill's coming due. That bill's coming due. And he's trying to intimidate her to get her to worry, to get her to fear that what's going to happen if she doesn't get the job. You know, and it doesn't matter what our battle is. The enemy has an intimidation tactic there that he tries to pull on us, that he tries to use on us. Especially when God wants us to do something, the enemy will try to intimidate us. You can't do that. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? We know who you are. You're just the child of Israel. You know, we're the Philistines, you know? And he was trying to intimidate and that's what the enemy likes to do. And Goliath used his words. He used his words and he used his size and his armor as intimidation for the Israelites. Really trying to intimidate not only them, but then David, who stepped forward, trying to intimidate him. What am I, a dog? <laughs> You know, I can imagine him laughing with a big roaring laugh, looking at little David and saying, what am I, a dog? You know, trying to intimidate him, to get him to cower away, to turn back. And that's what the enemy wants us to do in the battles of life. No matter if it's peers, co-workers, whatever it might be, the enemy is trying to get us to cower away, to turn back, to, to waver back and forth on what we should do, to turn around and put our tail between our legs and run. That's what he wants. What is it that the enemy is trying to use to intimidate you? Does he use your past? Does he use your past to intimidate you? Does he use your weight, your age, your gender? Does he use words from others to intimidate you? How about reports, doctor's reports, medical reports? Does he use those to intimidate you, to try to get you to waver and question what the word of God says? Does he use your bank account or your wallet to bring intimidation? Because you know our wallet and our bank account might say one thing, but we know and we serve the one that owns, what, a thousand cattle on a thousand hills or 10,000 hills? We, we know who owns it all. And we're a child of his. So our wallet and our, our finances might say one thing, but God says another. What is it that intimidates us? Your weaknesses? Your fears? A lot of times he'll use your fears to try to intimidate you. You know, he, want, he tries to place fear within you. We know that the enemy uses intimidation to get, try to get to us. Doubt, to try to get us to waver, to get us to question or to fear. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 of chapter 17. It says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. He used his intimidation to try to get them to fear him, to try to get them to fear and turn around and turn back. And then again in verse 24, and it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And that's why the enemy likes to, in battle, he likes to intimidate. So he can try to get us to fear and turn away. Now let's look at what Joshua, we're going to go back to Joshua 1 again. Joshua 1, but verse 9 this time. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, nor neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You know, like I said, that was for Joshua, but that's also for us. Be thou not dismayed, be thou not afraid. I am with thee. I am with thee. Isaiah 41.10, that he's with us. He strengthens us. He upholds us with the power of his right hand. God is with us. Be strong and be of good courage. That is what we're told. Don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. Usually in a battle, someone has to stand up. Someone has to make a decision to do what's right. To have faith and to say enough is enough. And that's what we see with David. 
You know, and I was thinking about this as God was giving this, me this message. He brought back to my remembrance when I was in the military in basic training. In basic training, it was all of us girls. I think there was like 64 of us probably in a uh, group, platoon, something, whatever it was called. I can't remember now, but there was 64 of us. You know, we all slept in the same quarters. We all showered together, ate together. We all went out to the field together. We did everything together. And I remember these six girls. And these six girls were uh, very strong and bold in their talk and in their actions. And some of them were quite tall, actually, as well. They were quite tall in stature. And, and there was just a group of them. And how many knows that when you have a group, it seems stronger than perhaps just one. So on the outside looking in, or in the inside looking out, they look, they look strong. They look like, ah, do I want to battle with them? These six girls made it a point to pick on this one girl. Now this one girl, she went into the military and she had shaved the sides of her head, but she, she pulled the top up so when she let it down, because it was hot in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, when you let it down, you could never tell underneath was shaved. Uh, beautiful, beautiful blonde hair, very, very shy. I remember her always, um, which is really intimidating as well, going into the showers at basic training. There was one pole with eight spigots around that one little pole, and, and there was like four or five of them in one room, and so all of you had to go around in there naked and be around the pole, and very intimidating. But this one girl, I think she was just so shy, she sat off to the back and sat off to the side, and, and she would wait until everybody left, because you only had so much time to shower. She'd wait until pretty much everybody was gone, then she would hurry up and shower and get out. I think that was just her being shy, and, and, and that's how she reacted to it. Well, they decided that to say that she was something that she probably was not. They thought that she was just standing there staring at all the other girls and, and lusting after them. And, and I don't believe that was so. And these six girls decided that they were going to intimidate her and pick on her through all of basic training. We were out at the field, out on the range one day, waiting to go out because there was another group in front of us. And as we were sitting there, I remember these girls picking up little stones, little pebbles, throwing them at her, just throwing them at her. And they'd ping off her, her, her cavalier helmet. They would just ping off her body and stuff. And she was only like two or three girls down for me. Finally, I had to stand up. I could not take it any longer. I'm like, this is not right. These girls, and the drill sergeants knew it. The people that could have done something about it chose to do nothing about it. They could have done something. So I stood up and I said, no more. I let them have it. I said, you bother her anymore? You mess with her anymore? You're gonna mess with me. And now I was, I was, you know, they didn't know it, but I was kind of shaking, you know? I was, you know, because there was only one of me and six of them. But enough is enough. Enough is enough. Somebody has to draw a line and say, that's it. It's done. It's over. It's not going to happen anymore. And from that point on, those girls no longer tormented her for the rest of basic training. They no longer picked on her. They no longer threw things on her. I don't know if they did. I don't know if it was because back then, believe it or not, I was in shape. I could out push up all of them. I could out sit up all of them. I was very athletic. And I think that maybe they saw me for what I was, even though I saw them as strong because there was six of them. They, they knew what I was, and I wasn't a Christian, so I, um, anyways. All right, so that was my, my story that, you know, stand up for what's right. Even when the battle looks overwhelming, even when the battle looks stronger than what it is, even when the intimidation seems like it's too much, don't fall for it. Stand up for what is right. All right, David was willing to take a stand for what was right. He was willing to take that stand when nobody else was. And we know how the Bible describes David as a ruddy little redhead, fair skin. You know, they, they, they picture David as this, this little teenager or perhaps, I'm not sure the age, I didn't really look it up. And I'm not sure that anybody really, really knows. But, but he wasn't much to David, you know. And that's how they picture him. So to David, you know, that big giant, that big giant. Probably, at first, might have looked a little intimidating, but not really. He says, enough. This giant, it's intimidating all of Israel. You know, it's defying our God, and David knew who his God was. And David knew that the battle was...
was not his. The battle was not his, but the battle was God because David had seen God move time and time again, killing the lion, killing the bear. God did it. It was God used David, but it was God who did it. It was God who got the glory. And David knew that God would once again get the glory. He did not waver. He did not doubt. He stood up and did what needed to, he needed to do. Verses 23 through 26 on chapter 17. 23 through 26 in 1 Samuel. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. All right, verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David had enough. It's, it's enough. This is going to stop. He's drawing the line. It's going to stop. The battle's going to stop. You know, the battle's not ours. We don't need to physically get in a fight and battle. If somebody's coming against you, you don't need to be physical about it. God is with you. He's beside you. We just need to trust in him and use wisdom. Sometimes a soft word or someone, or sometimes it's just a word, just taking the stand that you know no more. It's not going to happen anymore. Like, like I said with my son in the military, I didn't lay hands on those girls. I didn't do anything but say enough is enough. It's going to stop. And it stopped. But know that whenever you stand up for what is right, whenever you decide to make that stand that, you know what, I'm not going to go through this anymore. I've battled with this addiction for this long. It is done. I am done. Know that people are going to criticize you. People are going to come against you. Whatever it is that you're battling against and you're trying, to, you're trying to stand up against it and you're going to make a stand, know that you're going to get resistance. Even David got resistance. It says that David got resistance from his own brothers, his own family. How many knows that sometimes the resistance comes from those that are closest to you? Those that you love will give you resistance. Perhaps co-workers. Just know that resistance might come. But David knew, David knew that the battle was not his. Verse 47, verse 47, the very last part of verse 47, they call it 47b. It says, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. That's what David said to Goliath. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Know that the battle is God's, and God will give the victory to us. God's not a loser. God's not a loser. He's a winner. You know, and I love that song that Sister Glennis, all I can think about that this morning was I was doing this, singing, the battle's not mine, cried little David. Lord, it's thine. You know, and, and that's so true. But so many times we try to take the battle into our own hands. We try to wage the war ourselves and do it all in our own strength. And God says, you know, I, I'm there. I'm there with you. I'm in the midst of the battle to you. Just cry out to me. Call out to me. You know, God is our deliverer. He is the one that delivers us from the battle. Romans 8, verse 31 Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can stand against us? Who can stand against us? Who? There's none that can stand against us. If God be for us, nothing can stand against us. The, the, we have the victory. We just have to give it all over to God. And we need to remind ourselves that God has already done it. And that God is, remind ourselves as David did. David reminded himself, when he was talking to King Saul, he reminded himself that the God, it was God that killed the lion and the bear. It's God that did these things for me. You know, we sometimes just have to remind ourselves of what God has done. 
And if you're here this morning and you say that, you know, uh, I, God hasn't done a lot for me yet. You know, maybe you're newly saved or you just haven't had anything really bad happen that, that God has had to step in and you just see it as, oh, that's the hand of God. You know, you look to his word. Look to his word. If you don't have anything you yourselves can say, I know that I know that I know that God did that for me. I know that God gave me that healing. I know that God spoke that to me. I know that God, you know, if you don't have that to, to, to look back on, because maybe you're here this evening and you're younger, you know, and, and you don't have all those big, you know, victories that God has already given you in the past, look to the word of God. Look to the word of God and see how over and over again that it seemed like the storm and the battle was raging all around and how God pulled them through. How God shut the mouths of the lions for Daniel. Those lions should have eaten him up. They were hungry. But God shut the mouths of the lion. How God shut the mouth of David. Not David. Goliath. I'm sorry. Shut the mouth of Goliath. It was God. You know, we've got great examples in there. And we need to approach life when battles come our way the same way that David did. Faith in God. Trust in God. Call out to God. It's not our battle. It's not our battle. You know, a lot of times we get battles because we are the children of God. And it's said that, you know, it's, it's not us that they hate. It's who is within us that they hate. You know, and that's why we get those battles. I want to look at just two more scriptures from the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 34. If you would turn there with me. Psalm chapter 34. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. You know, whatever battle you're going through, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. He will deliver you. He will deliver you. And Psalm 34, verse 17, look at that one. It says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. You know, whatever it is we go through, if we cry out to God, know that he hears you. And that he cares for you. And that he delivers you from all your troubles. And it's not always how we think he's going to do it. You know? He doesn't do everything always exactly. You know, he may have delivered her this way, but he may deliver you another way. You know, but know that he's going to deliver you from all your troubles. At this time, I'm going to ask Christina to come to the piano.